Ready to go, guys? Ready. All right. Call to order the special meeting of the Hinsdale Board of Trustees for Tuesday, April 26, 2022. Please stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first item up is to approve the minutes of the special meeting of April 12, 2022. I move to approve the minutes of the special meeting of April 12, 2022. Second. Any changes? I've got one change. On page 7 of 8, letter E, second paragraph, six lines down, starts out with, applicant has agreed to change a specific poll. I think it should read, applicant has agreed to change the lighting of a specific poll. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Roll call vote. Trustee Passumo? Aye. Trustee Stifler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Thank you. Brings us the President's okay. report. Uh, vehicle stickers and animal tags should be purchased prior to May 1 to avoid late fees. Early bird pool passes are on sale through April 30th. Visit the village website for additional information, including payment options. As a reminder, road reconstruction on Garfield Street will begin next week. The Illinois Tollway is reconfiguring the northbound exit and entrance ramps to Ogden Avenue and I-294 to improve access and traffic flow. Additional roadway improvements to Ogden Avenue will occur as well. Project status and updates are available uh, on uh, the, web, the tollway website, which is www.illinoitollway.com. We have another proclamation tonight, and this is a proclamation relating to Arbor Day. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees, and whereas this holiday called Arbor Day is observed with the planting and celebration of trees, and whereas trees in our village improve air quality, increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community, and whereas the village uh, places a high priority on tree preservation, dedicating financial resources and qualified personnel to tree preservation activities, and whereas the village of Hinsdale has been recognized as as a Tree City USA for the, is it the 30th or 13th, my context for 30th. 30th, 30th year in a row by the National Arbor Day Foundation in recognition of the village's commitment to tree preservation. Now wherefore I, Tom Colley, village president of the village of Hinsdale, do hereby, do hereby proclaim April 29th, 2022 as Arbor Day in the village of Hinsdale and urge all residents to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and to support our village's tree preservation program. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to, uh, let's see, first read. <clears throat> For Matt. Yes, uh, item 7A is a first read. Uh, it's to approve the 2022 pay plans for all employees other than the police officers who are covered by the collective bargaining agreement. So this will include all salaried full-time employees, uh, part-time employees, uh, hourly public service employees, as well as seasonal part-time employees. Uh, the pay plans consist of a range and steps of pay based on seniority and responsibility. Uh, generally speaking, the pay plans are going to be uh, increasing by 2.5% um, with a few um, uh, differences from that sort of general rule. Um, some of the salaried positions have had um, the starting uh, uh, salaries and or the top end of the ranges adjusted where they were already deemed to be competitive with market. Um, some of the uh, ranges and steps for the year-round part-time employees have also been adjusted for market. And then perhaps the uh, biggest uh, change in particular um, dealt with our seasonal employees, um, such as those who uh, work at the pool. Um, uh, we were having trouble uh, finding uh, qualified people to work 
uh, at the pool and in some other part-time positions. And so there we have a, a fairly substantial uh, increase over the minimum wage of uh, $12 if you look at the, um, the part-time scale in the packet. Um, we're starting out at uh, $15 to be a, uh, a lifeguard or um, head cashier or a seasonal worker in, uh, in public services. But all the uh, salary increases uh, are within budget. Um, Tracy, did you want to add anything? No, I think you covered it. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Tough market. Huh? It's a tough market. It's a tough market, yeah. Yeah, particularly at the low end. But yeah. some of this was a result of the state of Illinois increasing minimum wage, right? That was an impetus for some of this. Well, except that the increases are actually much more than minimum wage because minimum wage is, is $12, and now we're going to have a lot of those right. seasonal positions that are at, at 15 Like, we, we were finding last year, right, that, that, that the – just the minimum wage wasn't enough to attract the right. kind of people that we were attracting well, in the past. It was, this summer, it was absolutely not. Last summer, it, it affected. Part, is that what you're saying? The last summer that we just had, we were not affected in this way. We were able to hold at minimum wage, but this yeah. year, yeah. we literally were getting no one applying. Yeah. And then once we did move it to 15, we have our positions filled yeah. and we are ready for a pool season. But I'm wondering whether just increasing the minimum wage has a cascading effect to require everything to jump. No, I think that's right, yeah. except that I, I think in the past our pool employees were, we were paying them right around minimum wage, minimum wage. right? Okay. That's yeah. Okay. And, 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 and Tracy, you did a search of sort of what other communities our, were charging. Um, public and private pools, yes and found that $15 an hour is the rate to be uh, competitive. Yeah, well, if this is what we gotta do, this is what we gotta do. It's okay. the efficient job market. Yeah, and, but it is in budget, so that's some consolation. Um, I don't know, is that, is, can this be a consent agenda or does it have to be a second I looked, read? it was last year. We okay. moved it to consent. Okay. Consent agenda, okay. Neil. Okay, uh, 7B is to award the contract for the, our 2022 resurfacing project to M&J Asphalt Paving Company. Um, so the situation here was the um, original, we originally budgeted $615,000 for the resurfacing project uh, in 2021 when we were making out the budget. Before the bidding process started, HR Green estimated that uh, there was gonna be, it was gonna cost a lot more, like a million forty-nine thousand due to increased labor costs and material costs because asphalt, as you may know, is hydrocarbon based. So as the price go, goes up, asphalt's gonna go up. So thank you, Russia. Um, we divide, so um, the Public Works guys we divided the bid into two bids. Um, so we could you know, see if the, we'd have a base bid and an alternate bid if, uh, depending on how the bids came out. But fortunately, uh, M&J Asphalt Paving Company bid 719,000 for both both projects, both the base and the alternate. And uh, although this was $100,000, $104,000 over budget, uh, Garfield is coming at coming in under uh, 557000 under budget, so we're pretty well good to go with the entire project. So I, I didn't understand. How, how was the division made between base bid and alternate bid? What, what was the thinking there? Well, the, these are the streets that yeah. we really wanted to get done. That would be the base bid is the ones we really want to get done. Right. The whole the whole project was the original planned work. Right. So this whole base bid and alternate bid was the original planned work for 2022. Right. When the economy and all the gas prices increased, we got an estimate from HR Green. Right. The village engineer and myself redrove these roads, and we tried to come up with a plan that would meet our budget. So okay. we looked at the condition of these roads for this year. We identified those as the base bid. And then we put together an alternate bid on things that maybe we could live without doing this year because the, the estimate was $400,000 more than right. what we thought it was going to be. <clears throat> However, we went through the market and we got an unbelievable price from M&J Asphalt. Okay. And they're offering up this price to do our entire planned right. road work this year. So bottom line, for 719, we can do base bid and alternate bid, so there's no reason to make the distinction any longer. Is Correct. Right? Okay. Right. Okay. It's all the planned work for this okay. year. Okay, got it. Okay. And, and by the way, I, did, I forgot to mention, M&J Asphalt, uh, it's kind of a new name for us. They have not done work for us in the past, but we checked their 
kind of check what they've done for uh, Willowbrook, I think Western Springs, and um, one other place, and the and the other the other municipalities had good things to say about right. it. So I think they, they are, are also IDOT pre-certified, so they're 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 a certified contractor with the state of Illinois. So okay. we don't see any issues with performance. Okay. okay. All right. So can that go consent? Yep. Okay, that takes us to the consent agenda. The first item is accounts payable. Okay. And uh, Benke had it this uh, this week, but he he uh, left town, so I had to take it over. <laughs> and um, but you'll notice I kept the expenses down to a reasonable amount, eight hundred thousand dollars, pretty nice. So uh, I found everything to be in order, though, and um, I'd like to make a motion to approve payment of the accounts payable for the period of April seventh, twenty twenty two through April 20th, 2022, in the aggregate amount of $800,517.18, as set forth on the list provided by the village treasurer, of which a permanent copy is on file with the village clerk. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Pastuma. Aye. Trustee <laughs> Stifler. Aye. Trustee Fisher. Aye. Trustee Burns. Aye. And unless somebody wants to pull a consent agenda item off the list and handle it separately, can I have a motion with respect to consent agenda items B through F? If I could uh, move F off of the sure. consent agenda. Thing. Okay. So can I have a motion with respect to B through E? Uh, move to approve uh, consent agenda items 8B through 8E. Second. Roll call vote. Pastuma. Aye. Trustee Stifler. Aye. Trustee Fisher. Aye. Trustee Burns. Aye. <clears throat> that brings us to 8F. Which 8F, if uh, trustees recall, this was the ordinance that was changing the uh, parking time and, and not having any any uh, to pay for with coins for parking any longer. Um, if you recall, at the last meeting, we had a discussion that there would be, the times would be from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and that the there would be a three-hour time window where you would have free parking downtown. Uh, that wasn't captured in the original ordinance, and we asked for that to be changed. Um, it was changed, but the old copy was put into your packet. So I just want to read it to everyone what, what is actually in there now. Uh, it's inserted and says, the hours between which such maximum allowed time limitations apply shall be determined by the chief of police in consultation with the village manager. So that's my only comments on this. Otherwise, it would have been on the consent agenda. And okay. questions? Hearing none, I'll make a motion to approve an ordinance amending various sections in Title VI, Motor Vehicles and Traffic of the Village Code of Hinsdale relative to the creation of a central business district time limit parking zone. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Pastuma. Aye. Trustee Stifler. Aye. Trustee Fisher. Aye. Trustee Burns. Aye. So what's the plan for implementing this now that it's passed? Uh, the plan is the same one well, on June 1st the changeover will take place. Changeover meaning bags will go on the parking meters? Correct. Bags will go on the parking meters. Sign will, signs will be installed with Public Works designating 15-minute parking zones and then the other zone parking areas. Okay, so we're going to put signs about how long you can park and the, the time Correct. that you would be required to meet the three-hour three, three hour minimum? Correct. Okay. And then after this meeting, the chamber said that they would uh, – do the publicity to the businesses because it's mostly the uh, business owner employees that we're trying to move out of those spaces. Okay. So we told them by the end of the week we would produce a document that they would then replicate and hand out to the rest of the businesses. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about implementation? Okay, that takes us to Neil, second read. Yeah, this is a second read uh, of what we talked about at our last meeting uh, for a text amendment uh, having to do with the village code regarding, or changes to the village code regarding outdoor dining regulations on the village right-of-way and review of the outdoor uh, dining design standards. Uh, I can go through my two or three page document from last time, but you probably don't want to hear this. So do we have any questions regarding the uh, design standards and text amendment issues? Is that the same two page document you went through last time? Yeah. Okay. No, no need. Good. <laughs> Chris did a very nice summary in the in the minutes. As a matter of fact, it was much more concise than I had. So, as usual. We, can I um, interject really quick? We did make a, a couple of changes to the ordinance since the last time. Um, one of which was just to make sure that we were being consistent with our liquor licensing, and we added a condition um, that alcohol may only be consumed by patrons when seated at tables to 
to prevent like outdoor bar areas. We originally had that in our design standard document, but we wanted to also put that in the codified ordinance. Um, and then we also found a couple of spelling errors, and then we made a revision to also um, require establishments to be good in good financial uh, standing with the village, so no debts owed to the village. Okay. Um, so those were the other two changes that were, were made, and we did start um, distributing some of the permit applications to businesses. So, so far we have almost one complete official application, but we are, we're still trying to work with everyone. It's, it's new for all of us. So, good feedback so far. Right. To, to the extent that a, a, a restaurant is behind on payments to the village, once they come current, they can avail themselves of this. Correct. Right. And then we would bring that application to the village board right. um, for, for official approval, okay. and then we can um, inspect that. Okay. And, and on a related matter, I talked with Trevor, and the uh, the plant the planters are on order, so uh, the vendor is working on that, and that, should, that seems to be moving along. Okay. <clears throat> You want to make a motion? Yes. Uh, move to approve an ordinance amending Title Seven, Amer Public Ways and Properties, Chapter One, Streets and Sidewalks, Section Five Point One, Commercial Use of Sidewalk Space of the Village Code of Hinsdale relative to the use of streets and sidewalks for outdoor <coughs> dining purposes. Second. Any further discussion? <coughs> Roll call vote. Trustee Postumo. Aye. Trustee Stifler. Aye. Trustee Fisher. Aye. Trustee Burns. Aye. Okay, Luke. Which uh, brings us to agenda item 9B, and this is a, a referral to the plan commission for consideration of a map amendment and text amendment to Article 8, Section 11503, Section 3-110, and Section 10-104 of the Hinsdale Zoning Ordinance and amendments to Chapters 1, 2, 6, and 7 of Title 14 of the Village Code to allow for the creation of a historic overlay district and related code amendments. Uh, additionally, this ordinance will change section 11503F relating, relating to variation standards and will simply allow historic preservation to be used as a criterion to support variation cases and to section 3-110 bulk regulations for single family districts to include non-conforming pre-code structures as a cross reference to historically significant structures. You know, quick background on this. I think we're all aware that there have been eight committee of the whole meetings in uh, conjunction with members of the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the outcome of these meetings has been the desire to establish a historic overlay district that would allow the village to do to offer voluntary. I want to emphasize here: this is 100% voluntary preservation incentives to historically significant structures within the overlay district. Uh, establishment of the historic overlay district will be accomplished through the subject ordinance via a map amendment and a text amendment. And I think it's important to note that the properties within the historic overlay district will not automatically be included. Rather, they'll be identified at a later date. And once identified, the properties will be allowed, the property owners will be allowed to seek, um, <laughs> seek incentives that are, that are the subject of this ordinance. Uh, if a property owner believes a home should be on the identified property list, but it is not, it may petition through the village. The properties are expected to be identified by the Historic Preservation Commission within one year of this ordinance, and final approval of that list will be subject to this board approval. Again, I want to emphasize here, every, everything we're doing here is one, about preservation, but two, it's 100% voluntary. So there's not going to be any type of encumbrances that will go on property or restrict property owners' rights. Uh, the voluntary preservation incentives will include, number one, fee waivers. For example, building permits uh, and other zoning applications will, will waive fees. There will be an expedited process at the Community Development Office. Uh, these types of applications will jump to the front of the line. Uh, third, there will be an alternative bulk zoning regs, which would alleviate the need for a variance. So for example, with FAR um, rear yard setbacks are, are two examples. And then the last two, which have financial incentives associated with them, one is a property tax rebate. Um, this will require a $50,000 investment to receive a village's portion of the property tax revenue for the next five years. So typically the village receives about 7% of your property taxes go to the village. So if you're paying $20,000 a year 
you avail your in property taxes you avail yourself to this to this program this incentive program the seven percent that we receive or the fourteen hundred would be rebated back to you over a five year period um, and then um, and lastly is a historic preservation fund matching grant uh, it suggested that we utilize thirty thousand dollars which has has been included in the 2022 budget and what this would allow for is if a homeowner makes improvements uh, to the to a property for t up to twenty thousand dollars then the village will match up to ten thousand dollars of that uh, and that's going to that initially is limited to thirty thousand dollars for the first year so for example if three applicants came in and made exterior improvements to their home greater than twenty thousand they could avail themselves to the ten thousand dollar match from the village uh, i think it's important to note that the historic preservation commission will administer the applications but any grant or any property tax rebate so anything having to do with money uh, would go to the board for its full approval um, and it's important to note here eligible improvements eligible improvements uh, include costs related to construction uh, but certain costs are not eligible these include anything on the interior um, painting on the outside fencing paving landscaping and uh, any improvements to non-historic -his accessory structures. So what this is really aimed at is preserving the exterior facade of the home. Uh, funding of the program will be reviewed by this board on an annual basis during the budget cycle process. And as I mentioned, it's been recommended that $30,000 be allocated for the first year of grants, which is included in the village budget. For any type of uh, tax rebate, that would come to us on a one-by-one -one basis, and we would be able to monitor that and, and capture it at any point if it got out of control. If it got out of control, one, it would be a good thing because then this ordinance is, is serving its purpose, but two, we would be able to dial that back. Um, so again, I, I tried to keep this concise, but this is eight hours of just meetings. Uh, it is, I, I, I don't know how many hours of uh, council's time and the community development office's time, but what I'd like to do is first turn it over to council, then allow Bethany to speak on it, any input from historic preservation, and then questions and input from trustees. All right, thank you, trustee. Um, <clears throat> so as, uh, as you alluded to, we've discussed this ordinance on a number of occasions at the Committee of the Whole. First. Uh, conceptually and then in draft format uh, since the last time this is before you it's been further refined uh, staff and I have worked um, to, to you know get it in its final form uh, one of the things we did was reorganize uh, it to move much of it to the village code the preservation title as opposed to the zoning code ultimately it just seemed like a better fit given the subject matter uh, there still are elements of it that we left in the zoning code by necessity because they are uh, truly zoning matters but um, we we created these two new chapters of the of the preservation title which I think works better um, the basics all remain the same though at the end of the day the idea is to take these historically <laughs> significant properties in the village identify them put them on a list uh, which will then make them eligible for certain preservation incentives and hopefully incentivize their rehabilitation, extend their useful lives for new generations going forward. Um, there's three steps left to make this fully operational. Once the board is comfortable with the text of the ordinance, you make this referral to the plan commission, which we're talking about tonight. And uh, the first two steps are gonna happen concurrently at the plan commission and then at the board. The first is the enactment of the overlay district ordinance the actual text that you have in your packet and you're looking at tonight um, consists mainly again of that brand new section of the village's historic preservation title as well as those zoning text amendments and because of those zoning text amendments that's why it has to go to plan commission under state law for this public hearing uh, relative to that language step two which again is happening concurrently is the creation of the map the boundaries of the actual district you have the draft map from staff in your packet uh, which shows, you know, these are the boundaries within which we anticipate almost all or all of these uh, historically significant properties will be located once they're fully identified. Um, so once the plan commission has their hearing on those two aspects, that comes back to you for approval. And then the final step after that, is, as uh, Trustee Stifler alluded to as well, is is for the Historic Preservation Commission to then uh, create this initial list of, of historically significant properties. Um, 
And, and those are the properties that once approved, which will be eligible for these present, uh, preservation incentives. And um, I think you mentioned that there was a year for them to do that. The ordinance actually says six months. Um, and uh, you know, staff has provided with them with some resources and, and I think you guys have some ideas as well as to, to what these properties will be. So uh, once we have this list, uh, they'll hold a hearing on the list, uh, move that along to you. And once the list is approved, then everything is in place and the owners of those properties are eligible for all these voluntary incentives uh, uh, relative to their property. And then, uh, you know, I know staff has worked on kind of the application materials and everything else associated with that. So I'm going to turn it over to Bethany. And the one thing I'll add, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, the one thing I will add is that um, after that list is created, we can do that process several times over. So it's obviously a huge burden to have 100 properties brought at the same time. So we have talked about, and there is language in this code ordinance of bringing several different waves of lists um, forward. It makes it a little bit more manageable, and we, we, we have some general properties already identified and some homeowners that are already interested in this program. Um, so if, you know, if after that phase, um, then we would um, be maintaining this list, and hopefully we have, you know, some information on our website so that people could readily see this as well. Um, I think Exhibit 2 is, um, is what is also referenced that Michael was just talking about related to that program information packet. Um, this includes some of the additional nitty gritty details that aren't all in the ordinance um, and kind of the submittal requirements and, and how this program would work, um, what we'd need. The, the largest thing is that once you were on this list, you would apply for a preservation incentive. Um, in general, if you are, um, I think it's for the, um, permit fee waivers and then for, um, like Mike, Michael said, not the financial portions of it, but just the permit fee waivers and um, some of the other ones, you would go, you would provide this application to the village and then we would route you to the Historic Preservation Commission for review. They would be um, responsible for making sure that you're just doing good preservation practices and it's meeting the intent of our preservation ordinance. Um, and then that would be the official approval uh, end there. Then we would go to building permit. In the case of financial incentives, we would then uh, have an extra step to route it to the village board and there'd be an agreement that an applicant would have to sign just pretty much stating you're gonna follow the plans and you're using village money, so. Um, and if you look at exhibit three in the packet, we did include a draft um, zoning uh, ordinance map here. Um, we've excluded as of right now, based on an initial review, um, we excluded uh, the O3 district, the B3 district, the R5 district, and the R6 district. Based on an initial review, there wasn't a high density of significant properties within those areas, so they are excluded right now. Any of the other districts, as it was referenced earlier, if you're in this district, the historic overlay district, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna eventually be on this list, but we've at least tried to exclude the areas where we don't think that anyone would be on that list. Did I, did I hear it right that if you thought you should be on a list and you weren't, there'd be a process for residents to apply to be on a list? If you're in one of those original districts that were identified. So if you were in the O3 district, the B3 district, the R5 district, or the R6 district, you're not within the boundaries right now, therefore you could never be on that list. Okay. Unless we did an actual map amendment down okay. the road. Okay. So that's one thing to note, because if we want to amend that map through this public hearing process, that's something we should do now throughout this process. Otherwise, it's it's simply a map amendment later. Yep. We, we could do that. Well, that would require a public hearing, right? Correct. And as well as a text amendment if we were to change any of the zoning code portions of it, that would also require a public hearing. Beth, I think this is important, but you you said there's, there's not a high density of significant homes within those districts. Correct. Right? Are there any though? From our initial assessment, the O3 district is largely the office park, right up on on Ogden. Uh, the B3 district, uh, when I when we looked at this, I, it was largely a lot of commercial properties that, that were kind of built in the 70s and 80s, maybe a little bit earlier. There's a, a little strip of um, B3 kind of south um, off of like Clay Street, that type of area where DuPage Medical is. Um, but neither, none of those properties ha seem to have contributing value. Um, and then with the Oasis, it's, it's you know, in the B3 district. 
So most of these areas, and then the R5 and R6, a lot of those are either um, senior living facilities or they're you know, uh, townhomes or, or other higher density residential. So when we looked at it, those districts didn't come into play. Um, exhibit four, we did include, and this will come more into play, um, especially when we start looking and talking more in depth about this with the plan commission, um, who's you know pretty um, more familiar with our zoning code regulations. We included some of the existing. What are you regulations. saying? They're more familiar than us. <laughs> they like it a lot more, I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so we did include some of the original zoning code regulations just to show the comparison of some of the areas where um, we're looking at providing that alternative um, you know, zoning relief or zoning regulations here. A lot of what we had heard from the original developers, um, then we had a couple of meetings and talked to some homeowners, was that um, you know, our zoning code doesn't fully align with some of these historic properties. So if there was a way to give people a couple more feet of room, um, they might be able to actually modernize a historic home and put that addition on, make that kitchen larger, get an extra room for, for uh, you know, the next child. So um, these, these zoning regulations that are being proposed, the alternate ones, are based off of our existing code and our non-conforming situation, but it is giving that extra couple feet that might make a big difference. So, these Bethany, I'm sorry, so just one thing, I mean, this must have been 12 to 18 months ago, we had a, a conversation with builders. Yep. And if you have a home, and one of the themes that came out of that is they want, they, they want to have the ability to do stuff as a matter of right. And if you have one of these identified homes, if, if the, everything here passes, then for example, they may be able to blow out the back, family room, put on a kitchen. Without seeking money, how quickly would they be able to do that? Can you walk us through the process? So as, it, as it's proposed right now, if they were looking for an alternative zoning regulation and potentially a building permit fee waiver, they would need to apply to the Community Development Department. Uh, we'd review the application, make sure it's good to go. Um, roughly, you need to apply you know, a, a month or so in advance of a meeting. And then we would route it to the Historic Preservation um, Commission for review. If everything was good there, it would be roughly a month or so to get approval. Obviously, there's building permit approval after. There, we'd have to make sure that the plans are code compliant. So there always could be some revisions here and there. But we really tried to expedite this process. Um, and you know, this I think this step will be a big thing. Yeah. Obviously, if you're asking for village funding, it will take a little bit longer. longer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and and you know, going back to this, these um, the way we also came up with these regulations is we did look at a couple of high, um, you know, we looked at a couple of case examples and some past uh, zoning variation um, examples to see what was the pinch point in real life. So um, the there's a couple of examples in here of how you gain five, ten feet in certain cases. It's really um, you know lot by lot, and we'll have to assess it as projects come in. But we really think that this is. Um, hopefully going to be a way to incentivize people to add on to their home and modernize their home. Or it could even come into play for, um, you know, down the road accessory structures or other ways that they can change their outdoor space. Um, and then I think that's about everything we have in this packet. Um, I'm open to answering any questions as well. Commissioner Prisby or Bonin, anything to add? Bethany, some comments earlier today or yesterday. We ran through them this morning, so I think you've got those all incorporated in some of the changes. Yep. Other than that, we're good. Sure. Go. Trustees? Yeah, I, um, I talked to Bethany about this yesterday. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, was um, putting the, uh, the dollar amounts with regard to the property tax rebate and um, the grants into the village ordinance itself. Right now in the draft, there's no uh, mention of any limitations or. So, sure. And help me out because I guess I'm a bit confused um, or just need clarity is. So on the grants, we've got $30,000. We put that in, at least that's what's been budgeted for this year. Right, that's the budget and amount. The budget. How, how about the, the tax? My understanding is at least we've discussed that it would work on a one-off basis. If one came to us, if two came to us, you know, if 10 came to us in a year, we might cut it off at some point. Is that, or do you want to have a hard dollar on a per year basis? Um, well, that's, I mean, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I actually was just referring to 
is the fact that in order to get the property tax rebate, you had to put $50,000 into your property. Mm -hmm. um, so that, um, that aspect is not in the ordinance itself. Oh, okay. yeah. Understood, understood. Right, okay. and, then, and then the fact that with the grant, you, um, you can get up to $10,000 for spending $20,000. So you, you, you get, you get 50% up to a maximum of, of $10,000. Yep. So those are the, those are the two things that are in the memo, but are not in the and ordinance. And you would also, I very astutely had mentioned that you don't want them crisscrossing. You can't, you can't apply, put 50,000 and get the grant plus the tax rebate. You'd have to put a total of 70 grand in right. to avail yourself to right. both, yep. which I'm right. completely okay with those. The question comes about is what I mentioned before, though, with a property tax rebate. We haven't had the discussion, you know, what's our appetite for that, or should we just play it as it goes? I, I think you play it as it goes. I mean, if, if we get too much, it's going to be successful. We're going to be happy. Right, and then we can talk about it if it is successful. But, you know, my view is just to see how it yeah. goes. Okay. And I guess the grant someone would get right away right. based on what's in the budget or what's, what's unused that year if somebody applied for a rebate, I guess by definition it would have to go in next year's bill. Yeah. Because because this year's bill would have already been issued. Right. right. And again, even if someone has a large tax bill, like say forty thousand a year, they're only that's only gonna be twenty eight hundred dollars. Not I don't want to say only, twenty eight hundred dollars is a lot of money, but it's gonna be twenty eight hundred dollars per year. Right. So we can keep a schedule of how that bill is to know what our our liability is. Right. I shouldn't call it a liability. What our forgiveness of potential revenue is going forward. Right. And I guess it, it, maybe I, I didn't describe this correctly. I guess I guess the way it would work is they would pay their bill to DuPage County or Cook County, and then the village would give them a check. Right. That's the way we do rebates. Okay. So they'd have to pay in full first, um, and then I think in our application packet. We have a you know page that they have to just you know fill out. We can go online, make sure that it's paid, and then we can issue that check. So they could get it for actually like the current year's taxes. I would say we can we can fine tune some things because we will have like like a preservation incentive agreement at the end of the day that everyone needs to sign. So right. we can fine tune some language in that. Um, but yes, it it could be for maybe half of the year, even if it didn't apply to you know they applied uh, halfway through the year. We probably don't, one of the things that's in here is we don't want to pay for like the, the past, right? So we don't want to pay their property taxes before they purchase the land or before they actually apply to us. So we probably only pay for anything moving forward after the date of application and right. probably approval. Because technically our bill is for last, like the bill we're paying right. in June is for last year. So maybe you wouldn't get a rebate for this year's bill. Another point, I just, I just thought about this sitting here, but if you think about the, what we're trying to do with preservation here and to balance this out, I'll go back again and use the $40,000 of taxes per year as an example. If someone comes and tears that house down, raises the property, and lets it sit idle for three years, which you see a lot, that $40,000 tax bill on vacant land is probably going to get dropped down to seven or eight grand a year. Right. So just in that three-year example, we could lose eighty to 90000 the community could lose eighty to ninety thousand dollars of total tax revenue. So we, even with this, I think we monetarily, depending upon how you read the numbers, we could be ahead. Yeah. And I'll add, we will be doing the same thing as well for building permit fee waivers. So we're going to be tracking all this as well and seeing how effective it is or how how big of a financial impact it will be. And you know, we're the the hope is that every time you bring an application forward, we'd have that summary of where we're at previously. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. And I'm sorry if this is in here, but say after three years, person applies, gets the grant, gets the rebate, and uh, three years into it sells the property. Is this going to run with the property, or is it going to run with the owner because it's the owner's money that was put in? You mean for the property tax rebate? Correct. So I believe in the um, program packet, and this this would be probably something that we're going to include in that preservation incentive agreement okay. um, down the road when we when we define some of that language. I thought in the program information packet we included something about um, there's a clause that it can run with the land because 
we had talked with some developers previously, and that's we know we're doing some of the demolitions and, and also have some of the finances to to flip some of these homes. Yeah. We did want it to yeah. extend with the land if yeah. you're doing a property tax for you guys. Yeah. So we set it up that way. And I also think we had a clause in here that like if you get you know approval, you do have to maintain those improvements for at least five years. I think that that was what we had originally like come to as a the idea of running with the land. Yep, right. We kept hearing that it's harder to find folks to buy these homes. Yet another incentive, perhaps, yep. to have them come on board. Good. And obviously, you couldn't tear it down. Right. Correct. Yeah, you have to maintain those improvements. Like I said, right now we have the language for at least five years, yeah. so the demolition wouldn't be wouldn't maintaining be the improvements. Yeah. Okay, so is the next step to send us to the Planning yeah, Commission? Yeah, this is the first time we're hearing this, but with referral to the Planning Commission, we can do as a second read, so we can vote on it tonight. Okay, and then what about the, the changes we've talked about? Will they find their way into the document we yeah. refer? Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then is there any, uh, I like to, when we refer stuff to the Planning Commission, I think that we've got a pretty complete document here, but is there any specific aspects you guys want, or the trustees want the Planning Commission to look at or consider? Hearing none, I'm going to make, an, uh, make a motion to approve a referral to the Plan Commission for consideration of a map amendment and text amendment to Article 8, Section 11503, Section 3-110, and Section 10-104 of the Hinsdale Zoning Ordinance and amendments to Chapters 1, 2, 6, and 7 of Title 14 of the Village Code to allow for the creation of a historic overlay district and related code amendments. Second. Roll call vote. Pastuma? Aye. Trustee Stifler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. <clears throat> so I want to thank the Historic Preservation Commission for their work on this. And the, the trustees, I wasn't involved in this process. This is committee of the whole. Thanks to the trustees and thanks to Luke for chairing the committee. So that takes us to discussion items. Uh, anything on the tollway, any update, other than what I said in my presence comments? Okay, anything, uh, department, staff, report? Nope. Citizens petition? Nope. Trustee comments? Okay, I have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Pastuma? <clears throat> Aye. Trustee Stifler? Aye. Trustee Fisher? Aye. Trustee Burns? Aye. Thank you. Thanks.